Okay. That's fine. That's All fine. Right. So here we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm David Preston, and I'm here with Dr. Maria Luisa Parra Velasco of Harvard University. And Maria teaches in the uh, Romance Languages, uh, Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard. She specializes, she's a senior preceptor. Uh, she teaches Spanish as a heritage language, and she has an MA and a PhD in Hispanic linguistics and 15 years experience in the fields of second language acquisition and child bilingual development. And we met through a company that was working with all sorts of different channels, and that company was working with text, actually, in dealing with the anticipation of virtual learning for the 2020-2021 school year. But out of that conversation, so many topics emerged that really affect everything from social justice to how we teach second language. And I was fascinated by her perspective, and I think she has so much valuable information to share with teachers, students, and families. Thank you so much, Dr. Parra, for joining us. Well, thank you, um, David, for inviting me to this conversation, and thank you to all the teachers that are you know, attending in this uh, Friday afternoon. It's sunny and beautiful here in the East Coast, which is um, not very, you know, often what, what happens. But um, thank you for, for inviting me. Absolutely. So I know that you have some information you'd like to share with us. We also have some questions that were collected. And I think we actually have, I didn't look just before we got on live, but we have teachers, uh, some administrators, and some students with us today. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, so please feel free to direct your comments all over the place. Um, and for everyone who's attending, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we can as we juggle the conversation. Um, to start with, one of the questions that came up was the question of power and the question of how teachers and students relate to one another. How does that support or contribute to heritage language learning and language acquisition? You know, when I teach open source learning courses, Students amplify their voices by creating blogs and representing their own thinking. What are some strategies that you recommend? Uh, and do you see any interdisciplinary applications for this sort of community of practice, as you've called it? Right. Well, thank you. This is, um, you know, a very important question. And um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, in order to get there, I would like to, oh, so you have to make me co-host. Yes, so let's do that right now. There we go. Thank you. So in order to answer these questions, I just would like to quickly, um, you know, revise some ideas that are behind this idea of power. Why do teachers feel and think that we have the power? Um, and that's, because we have the position of authority in the classroom and we assume we know uh, what we are teaching, in this case, Spanish. But when you are in front of an audience of Latinx students, students with parents or grandparents uh, from Latin America background, um, you realize that you might not know all what you think you know. In my case, I grew up well, I was born in um, Baltimore, actually, but I, because my father was a fellow at Johns Hopkins, but we went back to Mexico City when I was two years and a half. And I grew up there. I did my studies there in psychology and linguistics. So when I came here many years ago, and fast forward, I started teaching at Harvard 10 years ago with Latino students, I realized that I did not know um, all that Spanish that all these students knew from their own countries of origin and families. Um, so the first thing that is very important to understand when you're a Spanish teacher in front of this group of students is that it's not um, about the language because we talk about Spanish as a foreign, as a native, as a heritage, as a second, and we all get confused about that, right? But I want to emphasize that it's not the language, it's the speakers that we are interacting with. Uh, so those are the ones that are going to guide us in terms of what we as teachers need to give access to. 
Um, so just to make us all in the, put us all in the same page, I'm going to quote here the most cited definition of heritage learner by Professor Guadalupe Valdez, that is actually at Stanford University, pioneer on this, um, in this field. And she defined the students as a student who is raised in a home where a non-English language is spoken, who speaks or merely understands the heritage language, and who is to some degree bilingual in English and the heritage language. Now we need to notice that this note that this quote is from 2001. So we are almost 20 years later, and there has been a lot of changes in this definition, but this is just to give you a um, general idea of who the heritage learner speaker is. So it's not necessarily about the language. The second point that is very important um, to talk about before we get to the question of power is the difference of um, the learners, right? Uh, because they're not the same. And when we when they get into the classroom, they do not bring into the classroom the same uh, knowledge of language and culture. And we need to be very aware of it. So for example, um, if we have three areas where we can compare these two groups of students, context of learning, learning period and attitudes and motivation to study the language, we see very important differences. The first one is that a student that is interested in second in Spanish as a second language um, is going to learn it mostly in academic setting. And in academic settings, we have textbooks. And we teach through grammar and list of vocabulary because, wait, the textbook says it. That must be the way to teach it which is not necessarily true because we all learn our English language or Spanish language at home interacting uh, meaningfully with our loved ones and all the people that surround us, right? So David, in one of your uh, previous webinars, you talk about humans being ma meaning-making machines. And I really like that because we make meaning all the time. And language is a very powerful tool to make meaning. And we do that, we bond and we create and we communicate with, with people. So Latino students or Latinx students learn, understand and use Spanish at home to create affective connections with their family members. Um, but they don't have the follow-up of going to school and learn Spanish in the school setting. And people think that, you know, when they hear them use their Spanish, some teachers, some parents, uh, members in the community feel very entitled to say, oh, this student does not know. Mm. They don't know how to write. They don't know how to read. Of course they don't know if they didn't have access and there was no system to teach them how to do that, right? But they know a lot of things that a second language learner does not know. Mm -hmm. So that is very important because we teachers have the power to say to student, first of all, who they are and how to classify them and if they know or they don't know. Maria, so, let, yeah. me, let me interrupt you. We've got a question from one of our district superintendents who's asking, are you alluding to the ways in which we need to appreciate the funds of knowledge uh, mm -hmm. that our students bring into the classroom? Exactly. And, and that's, um, that's exactly what um, one of the like, main points of the courses that I have developed at Harvard has. I always, um, start by assuming that the students know the language and the culture and they are going to contribute to the class and I am going to be learning from them. Mm -hmm. I always assume a two-way learning process mm -hmm. 
that happens in the classroom. And I, that changes my power dynamics because then I assume that I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I can ask them, I can learn about that, and um, I can do also my homework. So I, I tell the story of one time when I was doing research with second um, graders in a public school uh, and they were classified as English language learners and I went to the classroom because I was interested in um, understanding how these children narrate mm -hmm. a story when they have two languages. So I was part of the classroom and then you know after the report I sat with each one of them and talk asked them to narrate a story book that we we have it's a the book is called Frog Where Are You it's a typical book that is used in um, language acquisition studies and the child that I was talking at that moment uh, the the book is about a boy who has a frog in a jar Mm. And he has a dog as a pet. And the frog escapes, and the boy and the dog starts looking for the frog in the forest, and they, you know, find and run into different animals. But when the boy was telling me the story, he used the word, the boy had a chucho. And I was like, chucho? What do you mean chucho? Is the boy's name Chucho? I, I couldn't figure it out. And my first assumption was that the child does not know the word that he's trying to communicate, right? And he continued using the word. And at some point, in some back of my you know, memory, you know, this neuron start firing. <laughs> and then I remember that in Central America, dog i mean they call dogs chuchos yeah. and that make me feel you know very humble and say eh, well it's me who does not know uh it's not the child knows very well what he's doing and the language that he's using so after that moment i always have that in mind students you use the Spanish language in the classroom. Sometimes I don't know the word, but that doesn't mean that they don't know. It's me who does not know. And I actually tell them as a, as a native English speaker, uh, if I say something like, hay muchas palabras en español que no me recuerdo porque no practico bastante, I have to confess to you that I feel like a bit of a fraud because I'm not fluent. I can put together sentences, but if you speak enough and fast enough, I'm gonna lose it because I still have to translate into English in my right. mind in order for it to sink in and, and have meaning for me. And so I asked them to teach me and to slow down. I say, despacio is one of my favorite words. Exactly. But also, when we read together, if it's in English, I, I also want them to feel free as long as I'm admitting my own need for them to help me, for them to be willing to take the risk because it's hard sometimes culturally to engage students to interrupt the white middle-aged guy in front of the room. Right, exactly. And, you know, you're making a very important point also. Um, that feeling of um, feeling as a fraud, many of these students come to the class with that feeling because that's the message that they have received in one way or the other. And I'm going to show you some powerful uh, reflections of students in a little bit, but I want to bring into this discussion of power, another dimension. It's not only that I am, you know, uh, have a PhD in Hispanic linguistics and I am a teacher of Spanish and I come from Mexico middle class that could give me this power over my students. We also have to be very aware of questions of race. And we have here a picture of two children, same ages, right? And if I ask you, who is a bilingual child? Uh, is the probabilities that you point to this child are higher. If I ask you who is the English language learner and the heritage learner, um, 
we, we tend to think about this way. And this is not a good way to think about. Um, and we have to be very aware of our biases in terms of race, because what research is showing is that race is not only mediated in terms of who is speaking and how we position them, but how we listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, so as a white speaker, I might hear similar utterances from these speakers in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So because you are, you know, maybe the white child will say, oh, this morning I saw a troca, and I can think like, oh, well, he's got switching and he's learning, and right? But if the other child says, oh, esta mañana vi una troca, oh my God, he's using Spanglish and you don't say it that way. And so our reactions from our own positions are also mediated. And I think that that's a, it's powerful. It's not a pleasant thing to think about, but we need to be aware of it because it comes into play all the time. So what I'm, hear, what I'm hearing you say also is that the, the learning experience isn't rooted so much in the curriculum. It's really located in the moment between individuals because that moment can be influenced if somebody has a cold and mispronounces, if somebody's having a bad day, if somebody's perception is skewed because their mind is elsewhere. All of these factors play into how we see each other and experience those moments. That's right. And the curriculum is very important because it also speaks to who is represented in the curriculum mm. and how you think about language and who is going to learn this language. And just to give you an idea, I'm going to go back to this um, slide because, for example, if we talk um, about Spanish as a foreign language that we usually do, we forget that Spanish is not a foreign language in this country. It has been spoken since the 16th century. Um, we don't remember it. We don't, you know, we, we think uh, it's something that is in Mexico and outside, but the communities, Spanish speaking communities in this country have been here forever. Um, first as, you know, a colonial language and now as a minority language. And at the same time, we still think about these speakers in different ways and languages in different ways. Just to give you an idea, at Harvard, we have these wonderful postcards to advertise summer programs um, in Madrid and Argentina. And we encourage our students to go and to speak English, um, sorry, Spanish. But in East Boston, communities are not free to speak Spanish. Mm. And we had this terrible incident uh, a few months ago where a mother and a daughter were speaking Spanish in the street and they were attacked. And we have seen similar um, incidents, um, you know, recently in, but they are not new. Uh, we saw the El Paso, uh, terrible massacre. We, we see all these attacks on Latinx, um, mainly Mexican Americans, the legacy, heritage, and language, but we don't see that. Uh, we, we praise it when the speakers belong to different groups. Um, One of the questions of that course, came up from, from our attendees was, do you uh, subscribe to deficit perspectives in language, specifically Spanish? No, I don't. Um, and I try to provide teachers with alternative ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you are saying that you need to practice or you have some phrases in Spanish, but you feel like a fraud, if you were my student, I would say, no, you already know. You probably understand more than what you think. And this way of understanding understanding means that you are a multi-competent speaker. And this is not my uh, concept, it's um, Vivian Skook um, concept. So we are um, trying to bring into the field 
different perspectives and ways to think about language performance. And students can perform very well if you give them the chance to use all their linguistic resources. We perceive them from two different languages, but they are communicating a coherent message, right? Um, so what we are trying to do now is to give students opportunities, plenty of learning opportunities um, to expand what they already know, to acquire academic uses of the language, to have access to those, but also to think critically about th these messages. Um, why people say that I don't speak correctly? What, who speaks correctly? Nobody speaks correctly. Um, so, and we want to give them the freedom to use their language to create the meanings they want to convey, mm -hmm. right? So, um, before working at Harvard in this, in this um, capacity, I work um, in a research program at Tufts University where we work with um, kindergarten children transitioning from home to school, Latinos. And I did a lot of home visiting when interview families and then I did do a lot of work with teachers, bilingual teachers, and, and work with the children in the classroom. And once you see how much a child can suffer and struggle because of language, mm. you can't ascribe to a deficit perspective. Mm. Um, so one of the pieces I, I sent you was a reflection on a teenager mm -hmm. fluent in Spanish but fail a grammar test. Not because of he didn't know, but because of the test yeah. that did not match the way he was thinking about his own language. And by failing it and by having negative experiences in the classroom, he lost the opportunity to engage and to learn more yeah. about his own identity and family identity. So that's why I don't prescribe to, um, um, you know, perspectives on, on deficit. Um, I don't know if you have more questions or you want me to... Yeah. We have quite a few and, you know, I'm wondering if you mentioned critical thinking and a lot of your work uh, as my early work was grounded in critical theory and, and Paolo Freire's work. Can you speak a little bit to uh, how literacy and agency work hand in hand with students? Right. Yeah, exactly. So let me show you um, um, just so you can still see my PowerPoint, correct? Yes. So these are pictures of the students I have worked with. So you have um, an idea of their, their faces. The first picture is um, the first group I had. And the second picture is the last picture I was able to take in a classroom with all the students together before the, right. the pandemic. <laughs> but you can see, you know, the, the diversity um, of the students mm -hmm. and they are very diverse in terms of country of origin, social backgrounds, race, and also um, generations. So part of my work is um, providing them with readings and exercises to understand where are these messages are coming from that you know, have convinced them mm -hmm. that they don't speak Spanish or that they are not members of the Spanish speaking community. And once they understand that, there's a new sense of empowerment. Let me show you some examples. I work a lot in my classes with art. I don't mm, follow a textbook. I design my classes by themes and important topics that I know that they um, want to learn about. And I have my teacher hat on because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about uh, some of our campus communities on the central coast of California 
and we have a lot of students who I suspect secretly have a lot to offer but feel so either disenfranchised or beaten up by the school system or whatever the individual psychology is that it's very difficult to tell uh, the difference between a student who has a cognitive issue, a language literacy issue, and a motivational issue. So if there's anything that you can offer teachers yeah. for engagement or for students as strategies of success, I think you're gonna have a lot of pretty excited ears in this audience. Wonderful, wonderful. So the for, I don't believe that students, that they're the issues of the students, motivation, um, I, I think that the system, you know, cuts the motivation over and over again in a lot of these cases. And I have a son who has um, some learning um, disabilities. So I know that the issues about cognition exists. And the best way to work with that is early intervention, good night diagnosis, in a good team at the school. And I have to say there's teams that I've worked with in schools with um, EIPs and 504 plans have been wonderful. And it has made a difference, the whole world of difference for me as a mother and for him as a student. That doesn't mean that we don't struggle with some things, but we feel that there's a sense of team and because we have a team and the message has always been positive about his capacities and efforts, not necessarily A's, but efforts and possibilities, um, he is moving forward. But when you have a, a, a teenager that is so sad about whatever he's struggling with or she's struggling with and the messages are negative, because you're not interested, you're not motivated, you're not, we don't give them any, um, any exits, any possibilities to move forward. So in my teaching, the piece that I take very much into account is emotion and affect. Mm -hmm. When the students come into my class, they are afraid of speaking. They feel that they are speaking the ghetto Spanish. Mm -hmm. They are inhibited, they have low self-esteem, they're struggling with um, identities that are divided, right? So my goal is to work with that. If I get to work with that, and I do it in Spanish, sometimes I welcome English when they can't really say the whole idea. I say, hey, say it in English. So they say it in English and then we work with the language again. If I get to put all those affective pieces back together, then the students continue studying, go abroad, connect with their families, and they have a better sense of themselves. And that's golden, gold for all of us, right? Yeah, really. So let me show you, um, when I work with the students, we work with a broad range of texts from you know, um, short stories, internet articles, but also art, plenty of visual art. And we engage with it as a, if it were a, a, a text. Mm -hmm. And the final project, um, one of your questions was about assessment. Mm -hmm. So I do assessment throughout the semester. I don't do tests, um, but I do give them assignments like, you know, to write different kinds of texts. We can get into that later. And the final um, exam, it's a creative essay where they have to create a piece, a work of art, mm -hmm. where they represent what they have learned about themselves. Uh -huh. But they have to write the essay too. <laughs> and we work on a first version, we work on a rubric, we work on brainstorming, I give them plenty of feedback. By the time they give me their essay, it's a beautiful essay. So I'm gonna show you reflections of two students, just to give you a sense of the stories they bring into the classroom. And 
why they're so important. And then we'll get into the art piece. Um, so this is a vignette and the text was written in Spanish, but I confess I use Google Translate. <laughs> um, I, have so that, here, I have that it, on my course blog so that my students can, with a click of the button so that they can share with their families if it makes it easier. The one thing I haven't found yet is a decent Mixteco translation because- Well, yeah, well, well, yeah, exactly. So we can, this is a student that I had this spring semester. Um, no, actually, what is this fall, spring? No, the fall, I'm sorry, it's fall 2019. Okay, it's gonna be a year ago, but it's 2019. Okay, and he was coming from high school and this is his experience. Uh, my experience in high school was plagued with um, discrimination and marginalization. Sadly, I can't remember a single day at school when somebody did not call me some kind of racial slur like wet back beaner. Some teachers, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna read just the bold. Sure. Some yeah. teachers didn't expect much of me uh, and they assume was, uh, I'm sorry, teachers did not expect much from me when they first met me, which I can only assume was from my looks and not from the A I got in my essay I wrote the first day of class. My pre-calculus teacher also specifically told me the class that she believed, oh, told the class that she believed the immigrants should not be allowed in school because they are a border on the educational system, okay? Um, this same teacher also told me that I would have a better chance of winning the lottery than being accepted to an Ivy League school. And he got into Harvard. So this is happening 20th century, 21st century. Um, and this is the kind of stories that we get at Harvard um, from these students. Mm. So his piece of art was this very, you know, powerful um, claw with all these terrible words that he heard and people told him, reaching out to this more, you know, calm uh, part of the you know, the art, the image is a Weiner library where he spends a lot of time and also has two musicians. He's a musician and he's part of the Mariachi Veritas at Harvard, right? And he wrote, um, the left side contains the resentful attitudes of my classmates, teachers and friends. The other side contains the positive perceptions that I formed in college as a result of a completely different environment. My perspective and my opinion of view had changed over time. The material taught in the course reveres all the dialects of Spanish rather than being prejudiced against them. Now I feel proud or pride for myself and my mother tongue instead of being afraid of being degraded for speaking Spanish. So this is an example of what a classroom can do and the environment, because it was not necessarily, I mean, it was the classroom, but he, the dynamics that we were able to set up and the listening that they did with each other. And I guided them in this critical thinking all the time where they have the voice, they have the knowledge, narrative and they had chance to present it in a safe space, right? Let me show you um, another example of another student. Um, she grew up in a Spanish speaking family, recently immigrated from Mexico. At the time, I didn't think I needed to speak Spanish, uh, to take Spanish classes at school as it was a primary language of my family and English was a language of my new home, the United States. In my senior year of high school, I decided to take Spanish class for the first time. And then I realized that the Spanish I had grown up with was very different from academic Spanish. I asked my parents for help with my Spanish homework, hoping they understood all the grammar rules that confused me. And it was 
when I realized that they had not learned the rules either, but the same Spanish from home that I had learned from them. I ended the academic year thinking that my Spanish was something I needed to fix, that I needed to learn all the formal terms and use a vosotros form from Spain. So this is a very powerful vignette because the classroom um, worked against the self-esteem of the student and disconnected her from her parents because she thought that, well, my parents don't know. Yeah. And one of the things that I insist when the students come to the classroom saying that, oh, I want to learn, learn grammar because I don't know grammar, I always emphasize the fact that if they are able to communicate with me in Spanish and they understand me, they know grammar. Otherwise, they couldn't do it. Yeah. The parents of this student, they knew grammar and she knew grammar. She didn't know the technical terms of subjunctive and you know, future perfect and imperfect subjunctive. Nobody knows that. If I ask my parents that have PhD and middle class and uh, daddy, what is the imperfect subjunctive of estudiar? He's not gonna know. <laughs> so that's kind of you know, a, a trap sometimes that we have as Spanish teachers thinking that the students, if they know the terms, they know grammar. And that's not the case. Um, so I see the same, see the same thing in, in literature when either in Spanish or in English, when students uh, come to classes in my high school environment, very often they haven't been exposed to reading as a good thing with parents at a young age. Uh, very often they associate it with school or with something that's difficult or painful or both. Mm -hmm. And uh, in school, if we're not careful, you know, we treat the analysis of literature like we treat everything else and we dissect it to the point that it's not, I mean, even when I read a book when I'm not in school, I'm not thinking about all of the literature tech. I want to get the story and I want to like get involved with the characters. And I think that for me, at least, what's been helpful as I see this is the idea that we can sort of backfill and validate the lived experience with the theory that the student didn't know existed to describe that so that we then share a common currency. That's right, that's right. Um, so I don't just want to ask um, about the time. So I make sure that I can have time to show well, I'm yours for as long as you're willing to share. And for our participants, I know that everybody's got a busy schedule. Okay. And so what I'll do is I will go ahead and record this in total, and then I'll annotate it with a timeline and links, and I'll okay. share it with you, and then I'll post it for everyone. So would the audience, um, is, are they planning to stay for an hour? I don't know. <laughs> ah, okay, you don't know. Great. Okay. So I'll try to put everything in about an hour because I think that that's a, a okay. decent length <laughs> and I would like them I would like to share with with them as much as possible sure. so and one of my favorite things about learning these days right now is the asynchronous aspect because so often we leave a conversation and three days later we think of the perfect thing to say and our students leave classes the bell rings and then something sinks in or a question arises so we have a unique uh, flexibility here uh, right so whatever your time is like, we'll work with you on that. Sounds good. Okay. So I just want to give teachers an idea of how, what kind of methodology I use in the classroom to work with these um, lived experiences. And the first thing that you have to know is that meaning is at the center of my pedagogy. I work with whatever I think is going to be meaningful for students and I'm open to hear suggestions from them. But one thing that I really have enjoyed is to expand the pedagogical spaces, not only to the classroom. Well, this was pre-COVID, but I'm sure that we will be able to do it. And now we can do it online. Mm -hmm. It's also in museums. Mm. Museums give us wonderful sources for teaching, engagement with the students. And in my experience, the student's dynamic change 
once you take them out of the classroom. Mm. The students that didn't talk to each other and that they, you know, exchange mean looks, they end up going together to the museum and talking. And so it's a wonderful experience. And the community. I have a course where we um, study the issues that Latino communities face in these times and students have to do four hours of community service at different organizations with, that serve Latino um, communities. So those, I, I work with those spaces and it's a wonderful way to expand your pedagogy possibilities. Um, I also put together sets of materials around one topic um, and I work with a movie, visual arts, literature, and music. And for each module of my class, I have these sets. And with each one of them, I follow, um, you know, the multiliteracy's approach of ex experiencing and talking about the known, a new information, new ways of thinking about what we thought we knew, Mm -hmm. uh, analyzing critically and always providing them um, opportunities to create and to apply what they have learned uh, to their own means. Um, I also always give plenty of feedback. I use Canvas. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, a lot of work. I try to be, uh, I try to target what I think the student would benefit the most from. Um, I don't necessarily correct every single aspect. And if I do, I just select three or four things that I ask the student to work on or to pay attention to. Um, but when you create this kind of rich environment when everybody is sharing, proposing, we are building narratives together, uh, then you get wonderful results. Mm -hmm. One result is, um, I want to show you these graphs that has to do, they have to do with um, small uh, project I did pre post uh, narrative. So we gave the students before the semester a short video uh, with a story that they had to watch and narrate. And then we gave them an equivalent video at the end. And you can see here the difference in terms of um, complexity of language, uh, thought as possibilities of subordinating different kinds of clauses between the first and the second. So we see here the, the statistical results were not, mm, how you say it, um, significant, mm -hmm. but you can see the growth here in terms of possibilities of Impression. So we thought that that was very interesting and important. This is an um, online reading program that I have implemented and you can see the growth in terms of speed of reading, the green, comprehension, the blue, and what we call um, efficient reading, the purple, uh, where they started very low and then they end up pretty high. Mm. Uh, this is a, a program that I can talk a little bit more later. But this is the graph that I like the most. This was made with um, the first cohort of students, eight students, so it's a very small sample. But by the evaluations I get every semester, I, I know that this is consistent. At the beginning of the semester, I always give them a form where I ask them to self-evaluate um, their own um, com competencies in different aspects in oral and written, formal and informal. So you see here that at the beginning of the semester, everything was three, two, academic text was two, academic writing was two. And I gave the same form at the end of the semester and you see a huge difference. And this was significant statistically. I didn't do tests. Uh, we didn't work necessarily with grammar except for, you know, my um, comments in terms of how do you craft a text. Yeah. And they really got it and, and felt, they felt very empowered 
to continue using the language. Mm -hmm. So in terms of using, um, I mean, what they express after the semester, and I'm gonna show now some art that the students have made in this project at the end. Um, so I ask them, what are the three most important things you've learned in the class? One is there is no one right way to speak Spanish. My, my Spanish is not correct or incorrect, but it is a part of myself. I don't have to punish myself if I don't know a word. Spanglish is not a bad thing. I learned that the Spanish I learned at home is really valuable to me. Um, and these are examples of the art and projects that they have made. This is a collage where the student, you know, put together pictures of their family members and the flags of both countries, uh, talking about how he learned in the class that their, his community and family are very important to him and are viable. Um, now, this is another beautiful project and the student says, I entered this class with expectation of learning perfect Spanish, characterized by the abandonment of my colloquial Spanish. However, I left with the understanding that the way I say it, imperfect or mixed with English, is just as valid. It also requires a command of vocabulary and phrases that make it distinctive. It requires as impressive and sophistication as speaking European Spanish. It allows me to connect with others in a way that I couldn't if my language was strictly academic or formal. There is power in familiarity and colloquialism. What I've learned is that my Latinidad made up of both culture and language can interact with my desire to fit into American culture. I don't have to be one or the other. I can be both and can work simultaneously. And this is a work of art that she made a beautiful butterfly. Um, it's a book where she has, uh, you know, one of the sides of the butterfly has a chapters. Um, and he, she wrote different um, messages in the butterflies around, diversity, fluid, uh, mix. So this is very powerful. And the last one to give you an idea of how they come with this sense of divided identities and how much we teachers can do to put those identities or to help them because we don't do it. We provide the space. They do the work. They do the um, yeah, they, they, they do the work and the reflection. So this is a student that was parents from Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. And the first part of her art here, you see her divided. And on one hand, you have the American flag and in the other half, both flags from uh, PR and Dominican Republic. The side of the US, she has straight hair and the words love, progress, friendship, hip hop, New York in English. On the other side, you see her curly Caribbean hair, Afro Latinx hair and the words in Spanish. But you, you see her heart that is divided. Mm. And then she wrote, Spanish 35 play an important role in helping me reconcile the two aspects of my identity that I perceived as vastly different. When I reflect on my identity today, I no longer feel a need to constantly move between two versions of myself. I have a better understanding of the complexity inherent in being Latino, Spanish speaking, and bicultural in the US. So the second part of her artwork is her heart, but it's not divided. And now you have all the words that were in English inside the heart in Spanish and the words that were in Spanish in English as a way of showing this integration. Yeah, you know, Maria, this is a good time to ask the question. So one of our teachers asked, um, 
first of all, if you could give a clean definition for teachers who may not be familiar with what a heritage language is, and then for our students who speak more than or think in more than one heritage language, how do you address that in a classroom environment or in general? Right, so the clean definition about heritage language, it's an um, interesting question because I started the presentation by saying that is not the language, right. is a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, so if we put the focus on the language, it's the Spanish language spoken by mm -hmm. a student, a person that grew up in a home where English was not spoken. Mm -hmm. But that means that it's a minority student and that the conditions, um, they also speak to the impossibility of using the language in a social setting mm -hmm. uh, like any other language, right? right? So it's more about the speaker than yeah. about the language, but we talk about languages, right? Yeah. Now, when you have a multilingual speaker, and I assume that the teacher that asked this is an English teacher. Yes. Okay. Um, how do you bring that linguistic knowledge into the classroom? I could think about different things in terms of, first of all, giving them opportunities to um, share their different cultural backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? And you can do that by essays, collages, family trees, um, and sharing with students. Mm -hmm. And the students will realize that, hey, we all have some ancestry or some connection to immigration and a different country and a culture, which I think that's very really important to become aware of. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot know all the languages and we cannot teach all the languages, right? But we can open spaces to recognize that those languages are part of our classroom and um, our community or society. Mm. And we can, you know, if we're talking about a specific topic in, in English, um, you know, share experiences from your own background. If you're reading Toni Morrison, right? Um, are they other experiences that are similar that can connect uh, with what the characters present us there? Um, so I think that maybe you cannot bring exactly, I mean, that language, mm -hmm. although you can ask, ask, write a poem in English and uh, write the version on your language. Yeah. I think you don't understand it, but it's a good way to provide that kind of space. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm happy to respond um, more questions. I really wanted to show the power of the stories of the students and how art can help bring them out mm -hmm. and how our work in the classroom matters, really matters to them. Mm -hmm. This is another example of a Mexican-American student, um, another student <laughs> that took on Magri uh, and, and uh, did it with a nopal. Mm -hmm. This is another Dominican student that represented the process of transformation um, using the colors of the flag and butterflies. Again, so butterflies, trees are kind of recurring themes on these presentations. Um, I, as I mentioned, I also work with community service and um, maybe, you know, that could be a, a different webinar. It, it, it's a lot to unpack there. Um, but I'm, this is what I wanted to present in terms of my pedagogy um, in the classroom and I'm, happy to answer any questions you have. Well, I have a couple that come up 
And sure. when, I, when I see butterflies, and I think particularly of Mexican culture, I think of the monarchs and the ancestors. And that leads me into a question about virtual learning. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the conversation, rightly so, has focused on the concern about students in their home environments from the standpoint of distraction or even safety and security and or access to technology. Um, I'm wondering if you might speak a little bit about the potential advantages or opportunities that students have in learning at home because when we talk about family and heritage language and uh, you know found objects I imagine that there are some ways that we can help connect some dots that will help them and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well I think that um, knowing that students are at home I'm going to talk about my myself and I think I'm going to be very careful this semester in terms of what I assume I can do mm -hmm. um, with students at home. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some students will be more than happy to share their environment with the rest. Mm -hmm. Maybe others won't be able to do it. Um, but something that I do, you know, very simple, uh, it's the, a show and tell. And they can, maybe we can elaborate a little bit more this time with them mm -hmm. or interviews with family members asynchronous but that they can bring into the classroom experience. Uh, maybe what's happening in their communities um, could also be part of the conversations, right? Yeah. Um, but exactly how to bring the home as a space into the class, mm -hmm. uh, I think that you can open the possibility and see who wants to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to push it for anyone uh, because I think it's, it's a, it could be a complicated Sure. I actually give students the choice whether or not to turn on their cameras for the same set of reasons. And frequently, I'm looking at, you know how Zoom sees on screen, so I'm looking at a bunch of black boxes with white names. Right. Um, but I think especially at the beginning of a semester, unlike any other any of us have ever experienced, uh, it's so important to be empathetic and at least create a space um, you know, I suppose if you're an idealistic teacher, you're doing that because you want to be a good human being and encourage comfort and security. And if you're a cynical teacher, then you want to do it as an excuse removal system. But either way, um, I think it's important to give students the choice. I'm also thinking about later in the semester, having students speak with at least one family member and whether it's TikTok or Flipgrid or YouTube, uh, but to record the conversation uh, whether it's about goals or a restorative dialogue or even something topical from their family history, just to have the experience of bringing the language out of the classroom and into the lived experience. Um, but I'm going to do those kinds of things as add-ons so that students can kind of select from a buffet and still have choice around that. Right. And once you know the group of students you are working with, Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's important what kind of dynamics you can include that won't um, make feel others, um, you know, in an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. So another question that just came up, and actually two, I just saw two from the same person. Thanks, Pete. Um, the first was, how can we ta change teachers' mindsets or attitudes about how we engage student learning of language? Um, and the, the second, which is related, I think, is that the intersectionality of language on a student's sense of self-worth and belonging may be something that teachers may not be aware of or don't focus on. Uh, so given the virtual environment, what challenge uh, do you think exists for educators, especially foreign language teachers? And um, what recommendations would you give? Right, and I think those were really important questions because it's true as teachers we don't think about our students mindset and the impact that we can have in them we are concerned about um, 
delivering our curriculum and you know learning um, reaching out our demands teachers have a lot of demands now um, and it's not easy for them to be thinking about everything at the same time however i think that for language teachers and for any teacher when you change your focus from covering a textbook and a program to who are my students? Mm. Who am I working with? Mm -hmm. That is an important question we need to ask all the time. And I've been teacher for many, many, many years now. Uh, it's the only thing I've done um, since I graduated. And I think that every semester I learn something and I have learned to become humble and remember that I'm working with students that can be fragile, mm. that can be uh, also very strong, but that I need to take that into account. Yeah. Maybe having two teenagers um, has helped me to see that they I mean, it's not that they are lazy or they don't care or there's much more behind that. And we need to tap into what, what's going on with them to really engage them. I think that the big challenge for teachers is to learn how to engage each student. Yeah. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. And I think a lot of teachers do it and try to do it, which I think is very valuable. And if we can't do it, we need to keep thinking about, well, what could I have done differently? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's an ex you know, exercise, continuous exercise that you have to do over and over again. Um, I cannot tell you how much I've learned about myself. Yeah. Um, and my cognitive biases, my prejudices. Uh, it's true. I mean, you laugh, but it's, it's no, not fun. I'm, I'm, <laughs> laughing. I'm laughing because I'm hearing my own thinking out loud. In fact, I know that it's about noon, so I'm going to bring us back closer together here. And uh, But, but it's, it's, we have to do it. We have to do it. No, it's so important. Um, I'm going to, let's see. I'm not going to stop our conversation, but I wanted to bring us back into closer view here um when I, I the reason i laughed is because there isn't a day that goes by whether i'm on campus and going home or whether it's after a class taught with students where i'm thinking about why didn't i hear that differently or what could i have said that would have been more appropriate or how, how could what did i leave out and so it made me feel so not alone when you said that that's why i laughed right no and i mean for teachers out there I have said things in the classroom that, you know, I get to my home and I'm like choking and I, I talk to, you know, my, my husband, who is also a professor or sometimes my children. I say, hey, I, I said this, you are a teenager and a student, help me. And sometimes they laugh at me because they think that I'm overreacting. And, but I always go back to the classroom and the student and and try to say, hey, you know, yesterday I said this, I thought about it, um, and we, we talk about it. Um, and I think that, that that has been an important exercise um, for me and, and for them. So really, I think to summarize everything we've talked about so far, what we're really talking about is we're really talking about learning each other and ourselves through the experience of sharing language and, and learning about the language itself. Um, I am so curious and I hope we can find a time to continue with the community piece and extending this out. But for today, uh, Maria, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Well, I thank you. really appreciate thank you. this. I will curate this and send it to you and then I'll share it with everyone. And in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, and if you have any questions for Dr. Cara, I will forward those along as well. I just want to say one last thing, and uh, I have um, an initiative at Harvard for teachers, and I have included some high school teachers, and we have developed a website with a lot of materials, open source, 
um, and links to lecture series. So I will be sending you the link so you can share with everybody. Oh, and I wow. really appreciate the questions and, and the opportunity. Great. Well, thank you very much and for all the work you do. And we'll catch up soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Take thank care. you. Bye. Good luck to everybody. Bye.